So we're gonna turn down Main Street. Wickford is a village that was settled in 1709 uh, by the Updike family as a, a location where they envisioned being a shipbuilding center. And by the time of the Revolutionary War, there were five shipyards building ships here in, in Wickford, employing most of the people. Each and every one of these houses were owned by somebody tied in some way or another to the shipbuilding trade. Even like these two, the Wickford House and the Narragansett House, both owned by former sea captains who decided they'd give up a life of the sea and opened up taverns and inns in the village. People would be coming from all over New England, perhaps to check on the progress of a ship they're having built here, and they would stay in these two inns. the sailors who were tying up the docks with their ships and getting ready to be loaded with casks of salted cod or rum uh, would come up the road and climb into these taverns and have themselves an icy cold one and a, a, a glass of rum uh, and uh, enjoy the village. So this, in its heyday, in the period from around the revolutionary period all the way into the early 1800s, this would have been a hustle and bustle place with all sorts of things going on. In the research, there was this shot, which was farther down the street towards the wharf. And I thought, well, this is perfect. I got the photograph into the computer and then looked through historic resources. I happened to have this shot of these individuals I had taken on a trip to Sturbridge Village um, in Massachusetts. And, you know, they're what, mid 1800s, so they were perfect. Um, other artists, such as the gentleman here, is from an Eastman Johnson painting, as is this man here who's whittling. So I was looking um, and borrowing from earlier artists of the period to populate the painting. So what I did was got that into the computer and then cut around the figures, and I was able to insert them into this was a photograph of, of, you know, this actual scene. So I was able to compose it. This is probably the most populated painting I've ever done. I'm a career artist. Uh, it's been my life's career. Um, and I have done many things within the art world in order to um, <laughs> survive as an artist. And the thing that I've seen is I don't have all the artistic answers. I mean, sometimes a collaboration forces me to do things in such a way that I normally wouldn't do. And as a result, I'm producing a better product and it wasn't all of my own thinking. The painting now happily resides in my studio, actually as, as a sales piece in the sense it shows people what I'm capable of doing. And if anybody was ever so interested uh, to want to purchase it, well, I'd probably be happy to sell it. Now we're gonna head down now to the dock and we're gonna talk about the connections between Newport and Wickford in the Victorian era. What happened at that time frame was folks like Cornelius Vanderbilt and John Jacob Astor, they all had their big summer cottages over there, you know, the Breakers and Marble House that they would come to and entertain and spend their summers in. They wanted a nicer, cleaner, quieter, more peaceful way to get to Newport. So what Vanderbilt did in thinking about it was he paid for a small rail line that was set up that ran from Wickford Junction you know, all the way down here to Poplar Point. A ferry would be tied up there and the ferry ran from 1870 to 1920 from that location and would go back and forth to Newport. This was a wonderful boon for the village of Wickford. We had jobs associated with it and we had people coming into the village. An awful lot of the next tier of wealthy folks who enjoyed Newport and the social life that was there in the summer looked at Wickford as an opportunity. Real estate prices were much cheaper than they were in Newport, and there were fine colonial era homes that could be had for a song and a dance. 
and then could be restored. That's really why Wickford is in such wonderful shape at this time frame, was that influx of cash that came into Wickford in the period from the 1870s to the 1920s, and one by one had all the homes restored. So it really did everything for making Wickford the place it is today. I was uh, a Navy wife and living in Wickford, and we moved around a lot, but we were in Wickford for several years, and it was um, as much home as a Navy family would find. We loved, loved Wickford. At that time, uh, the Garden Club was having a sort of walkabout, so a friend had asked me if I would do a map for the people who were taking the tour, and that's how this, this came about. Just some of the local color of, of Wickford was incorporated, chief of which I always thought was Jonathan, the uh, mayor of Wickford, who was the Basset Hound, who would walk around through Wickford and um, visit people, and everybody would reward him with a treat. And when they did that, Jonathan grew, and he grew, and he grew, and finally, <laughs> His owner hung a sign around his neck and said, please don't feed Jonathan because his tummy is dragging on the ground now. I'm very honored and I hope it will um, explain things well. I think as people, visitors come to Wickford, it will take them all throughout the village and they will make discoveries about its history that they did not know before. I think it's a, a wonderful idea. We'll stop here by this marker, the Pleasant Street marker. This house actually was the house constructed for the grandson of Lotto Uptike. Designed by a Newport architect and built in the style of a Newport colonial mansion, the Updikes built this house to make a statement. This is my grandson's house, he's an Updike. We are important people and this important house was here. It was owned by Alonzo Cross, the founder of Cross Pens, and he's one of these guys who came in here um, during that time frame and bought the house for a summer place to live. Now, Alonzo loved the house. He was fell in love with it. It was on the street in line with all these other houses. Mrs. Cross said, I don't want that house. It doesn't have a front yard. So he picked it up, moved it back on a new foundation and gave her a front yard so he could buy the house. And this is the kind of uh, financial wealth that the, those people in the time frame had and if you do the research, you can find out that a lot of this has to do with the fact there was no income tax back then. All the profits that Alonzo Cross was making selling pens and pencils was his money. Many of the markers have actual photographs that help us to get a feel. This is, this is a uh, three-masted schooner tied up right where we were, uh, one of the only pictures we have of a large ship tied up in Wickford. And Lorraine, who did this, utilized that ship to kind of put a ship in here, and she's added another another smaller uh, sloop here um, to give you an idea of what this place looked like in the time frame. I probably had an advantage over some of the other paintings that were done in that this house still exists. You know, I tried to picture what it would have looked like. It was, you know, it was a little challenging. So, you know, trying to do a little research on the, the types of ships that were, uh, you know, at that time. And then, you know, the, the, the way that the people and the dress, you know, of that era with other little boats and little other little um, tidbits of uh, construction and wood and worn roads and the birds trying to make it look like it what might have looked, you know, at that time. Tim uh, Cranston gave me a, a great picture of this ship um, in the actual spot from the 1800s. 
Seeing that ship that Tim gave me, you know, in, in that harbor really was the magic, you know, that made the piece, I think, work. I mean, to, you know, to still have that kind of a photo around was, you know, just uh, the key to that painting. When I lived in Wickford, I walked uh, every morning those streets. So I'm in love with Wickford. So I was very, you know, honored and, you know, to, to be able to do this painting for, for Wickford and my legacy. to stop here and uh, we are going to get out if you want to uh, go and look at the Narragansett Indian Marker which is about 75 feet down the pathway. This area we're in is called the Bush Hill Nature Preserve. Uh, these pathways go through this nature preserve. It's about a seven or eight acre parcel of land. Beautiful locations, nice little pathways. You can never get lost in here. It's just one of the little hidden gems of Wickford that most folks don't realize is here. Before this was Wickford, starting in the very beginning of the 1700s, this was the Kakakwisik to the Narragansett people. And that Narragansett word translates roughly into a high place almost completely surrounded by water. The Narragansett people never used names. There was never any ownership in, in the way that the Narragansett looks at land. So this would never be called Chief Kananchit's land because they didn't even understand the concept of land ownership. In their mindset, they were a part of the land. They were an integral part of the land. They were caretakers of the land, but they had no ownership stake in it. And this was a problem for all of them. To a native person like an Narragansett, when you're signing a piece of paper about land, what you're doing is you're signing a document which says, I agree to share this place with you. I honor you and you honor me, and we will come and we will share this place. We will live here together. You will become a part of this place too. Of course, the English say, you just signed this piece of paper, I now own it, and you got to get the hell out of here. But the native people did not understand that. And this is the basis for what I call the land envy, which always uh, ended up um, driving and eventually ending in war between the people who were here before us and all of us who came here afterwards. And the reason for the land envy in New England is evident in two paintings done by two different Narragansett Native American artists who I brought here and showed them this place. This painting here shows you what one of the villages would look like. I brought them here and I looked at this and they, they felt the same that I did. This had to have been a place that they would have settled. And they drew a replica of what they know, what a Native American village would have been like in 1500. So this final piece is a summer village. I visited that actual location multiple times, imagining it to be not so overgrown, like the trees were receded and there was more land available. The water would be flowing more. My husband is actually a, a builder. He, he builds these homes and we, we bring the I'll say the, these types of pictures to life and, and do historical villages. So it was interesting to have to draw something that I'm used to putting together. So a summer village would typically be with Witus, which is the smaller single family, and then Nishpatos are the larger dwellings. There'd be a garden that went around that People would be utilizing the water and the food that's available. And then because we also had all of this nice um, grasses growing there in the perfect, in perfect picture, you would also be able to collect and harvest um, cattails or any rushes, you know, bulrushes that were available 
also on the shoreline. So I tried to include as much as possible to show um, what a village would look like. There's a lot of detail in it, and I'm not sure that most would know that, but there's, there's a lot going on. So there's two artists working on this particular scene. So I didn't know if we were both going to be trying to do this landscape village scene or not. So I think that the way it worked out, it, we actually complemented each other. Now the Narragansetts, you may or may not know, had, were raising corn and practiced what was called the Three Sisters Planting Strategy, which was really agricultural science at its best for the 1500s. They would make a mound of earth and they would put fish in it. They provided fertilizers to the mound. They would start with the maize, the corn, and plant that, let it get established and growing, and then they would plant the other two sisters that they called them, the, the beans, hard shell bean, and the winter style squash or a gourd squash. Now the beans were trained to go up on the corn stalk and the corn stalk would support them. The squash plants, whether it be a gourd or a winter squash, were, were, were trained to go around the mound and the big leaves of the squash plant would shield the mound itself from the sun drying it out. And so it was a perfect strategy for growing. Veranzano, who came over here in 1524, one of the first white people to enter the Narragansett Bay, noted quite forcefully that the western shore of the Narragansett Bay was the most densely settled place in the entire New World that they had seen. And he was amazed by the success of the Narragansett people here. After reading the copy for the marker, um, I wanted to do something that depicted one word in there, and I chose the corn or the maze is what I chose. In Dawn's image, she was able to capture, okay, this is the life, this is what we lived, and this is how things work, but I just wanted to pick something out of that, that everyday life. It takes a long time. Uh, what I do, it, it, just to explain, okay, there's there's eight or nine, sometimes up to 14, 15 colors in one section. And what I do is I, I do what's called cross hatching and I layer and layer and layer. It's very time consuming, but the effects, I like them. When seeing the marker, I was, I was glad because even though it was two different pieces of work and they were both executed differently, they still really complemented each other really well, including the color, and we didn't know this. In Like Dawn, I, I, I was glad that the Narragansetts were included in the markers and included in the process because we seldom are included in these kinds of things. So it, I know personally it was an honor um, and I, I am pretty sure Dawn feels the same way that we were remembered and that that's important. So as we walk back down out of the uh, Grand Highway area, We'll come to the last marker we're going to talk about. And that is kind of to pay homage to the shipyard industry. They said there were five shipyards here in Wickford. The fifth shipyard was here on this cove. And it really talks to us about many things. First, what did they do here? They primarily made ships hulls here, which they then would float out on a high tide to another shipyard where the, the hull would be finished out the decks will be put in, the masts, the rigging, and et cetera. But it also tells us, because now, a good Canada goose can walk across this cove. You would never imagine it would be deep enough for it to float a ship's hull out of here. At the time frame, the reason that the Updikes knew they'd do well with this location was that Wicker was a naturally flushing deep water port. 
tide would come in and flush the sediments out on each and every tide change. But when uh, Wickford was changed by adding impediments to that flushing action, primarily the big breakwater that was put in after the 1954 hurricane, the natural flushing action did not occur anymore. So this cove where you could once build sailing vessels now is not even shallow enough to even launch a sailing vessel in. It's a whole different cove here because of the fact we've restricted the flow in and out of it. Who would imagine back then that they would come up with this idea? Let's build boats in this spot, have a bridge to get to the other side, <laughs> other side of the village, and then take the bridge apart so we can float it out uh, to another shipyard. How cool. I found a book at the province um, library called The Building of a Wooden Ship. Uh, it's full of uh, black and white illustrations. I used that as a guideline to come up with uh, shapes of, of hulls uh, to use in this, in this painting. In my research, I found out that there was a, um, a wooden footbridge that could be easily disassembled to transport the hulls, because all they, all they did at this location was build the ship hulls. Once the bridge was removed or disassembled, they floated the hulls out to another shipyard where the completion of the ship took place. So it was a lot of imagination to make it look like it was um, a working spot, but there was a lot of things going on there. And as I moved along, I would check with Tim, is, 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 this, is this working? And so he would direct me uh, with a yes or a no, or we need this illustrated. So it was just a whole collaboration of uh, material that I gathered to come up with a, a cohesive image. So this was a huge learning process for me, uh, not only historically, but um, how to go about putting this together, because I've never worked this way before. This marker here is the main marker, which details the whole walk. This is where the handouts will be located. So when you come back to Wickford this summer to visit, you'll be able to get a handout there that'll have the little map on it, some small representations of all the artwork, and you'll be able to walk around and take the tour yourselves. And I hope you will. Come back with your family and friends and enjoy Wickford this summer and, and enjoy the walk. Come back to Wickford. Enjoy it. Thank you Thank for spending you. your time with me today. I appreciate it.